Hello, welcome everybody. Just give it a couple of moments while our everybody's sound connects. Just check we haven't got anybody else still in our waiting room. It looks like everybody's there. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon um, for this fantastic session about uh, the 50, 50 years since the uh, Women's FA Cup uh, final. Um, my name is Fran Stovold and I'm from Sporting Heritage and for those of you who I've not met before I run the Workforce Development Programme which is our webinar programme including sessions like this but also um, our networks and our conference which takes place in October each year. I'm just going to do a quick bit of housekeeping and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague Derek who's going to facilitate today's session and introduce our guests who we're really lucky to have with her but I won't steal his thunder um, or their thunder to that matter. So Quick bit of housekeeping um, before we start. We are recording the session, so if you don't want to be recorded today, please by all means turn your camera off. Um, because we've done it in the meeting format, um, everybody can see everybody else in the room. So if you want to concentrate on our speakers, I recommend you have your screen on speaker view. If you have technical difficulties today and for any reason you drop out of the session, I will keep an eye on the waiting room and let you back in um, as soon as I can. So just click back on the link and it will take you back into the waiting room and we'll pop you back in. If for any reason we have technical difficulties at our end and the session goes down, we will endeavour to get everything back up and running within our allotted time span. If for any reason we can't do that, I will contact everybody as soon as possible to let you know so you're not left there hanging in the ether. So I think that's all the technical information from me. Derek, I'm going to hand over to you to start today's session. Thank you very much indeed, Fran, and good afternoon, everybody. It's just wonderful to see you and hugely excited to have this opportunity to be reflecting with two such very significant guests on the 50th anniversary of the Women's FA Cup final in 1971. And... Um, I was thinking perhaps a subtitle for, for the session might have been 50-50 because, of course, that uh, cup final in 1971 followed 50 years after the, the ban on women's football that goes right back to 1921. So there's a particular symmetry and resonance there that perhaps we might want to um, reflect on as part of our discussions this afternoon and to lead those discussions. I mean, it's an absolute privilege to introduce Chris, Chris Slegg, and Laurie, Laurie ha Howie, um, we've been just been having a little bit of a discussion um, before we came on live. Uh, just, just, just to context for Chris. I mean, I think the work that Chris has done, and I think uh, Patricia, Patricia Gregory, the co-author of um, a history of the Women's FA Cup final, is is on with us actually the, the, this afternoon. Um, as well. I think Chris and Patricia have done so much to actively promote the history and heritage and significance of the women's game and the, 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 uh, the changes that we currently see in terms of its profile within the, the media. Um, Chris is going to lead the first part of the, the the session. I think there will be some historical reflections. Um, and, and I choose that term specifically because Chris and I have quite a long history as well. And, and I'm delighted to say I actually taught Chris A-level history not quite 50 years ago, but I think it was about 25 years ago. Uh, and, and to see, um, you know, well, I, I won't reflect on what he did as a student, but his passion and enthusiasm were, were certainly very clear there and see it translating into this amazing work is an absolute privilege. And then with Laurie, I mean, how amazing that we've actually got um, a, a player who had the experience of winning the FA Cup back in 1985 um, with Fulham, um, played in two other finals um, as well, represented her country. And I think her insights that will follow the context that Chris gives very practically are going to be absolutely amazing. So we have a wonderful afternoon uh, lined up. Very, very grateful to you all for joining us. I'm sure you'll have questions in response to both um, Chris and Laurie's insights. So without further ado, um, Chris, I'm going to pass over. Thanks, Derek. And yeah, thanks, Fran, for having us on. Um, thank you, Laurie, as well, for being here with us. And a massive thanks to Patricia Gregory, who is in the audience, who helped write this. We wrote this together, the history of the Women's FA Cup final. And um, kind of the inspiration behind that for me was the fact that 
I've spent my whole life reading about football, reading about the men's FA Cup. Every book on my bookshelf, every sports book was about men's sport. And whenever I tried to find out anything about the women's FA Cup or women's football, it was an absolute nightmare. There's just no information out there. Um, it's very hard to track down any of the statistics and any of the facts. Um, and about 15 years ago, I worked with Patricia Gregory when she was at BBC Sport. Uh, I knew a little bit about her story and how she had helped set up the Women's Football Association in the late 1960s, how that organisation lobbied and, and, and in the end managed to play a huge part in getting the FA to overturn that ban that you mentioned Derek, that effective ban that was brought in in 1921, which prevented women from using any FA pitches, any FA officials, any FA resources, basically meant women could not play in, in this country. And uh, Patricia and her organisation helped overturn that. One of the first things they did was to set up what was called the Mitre Challenge Trophy, uh, became the Women's FA Cup. And that was the first national competition for um, teams in this country and Scottish teams as well. Until that, um, until that point, teams had really only been playing each other's on a on a regional basis. And that, in the group stages of the early FA Cups, that was still happening. But in the latter stages and the final itself, the the best teams in this country could meet each other. So I I knew from Patricia's backstory that she would be the key to to helping me cobble together a lot of this research. And the wonderful people I've been able to meet through Patricia, like Laurie. I've been able to speak to so many players, dozens of players, thanks to Patricia, putting me in touch with them, living all around the country now, living all around the world now, in fact, and hearing their stories of, of the early years of this competition has been absolutely fascinating. Um, what always struck me was the argument when I was growing up um, was that our women's football isn't good enough. Um, People don't want to watch it and people don't want to read about it in newspapers or in books. Now, I love all football and I watch non-league football, which has never been short of coverage. And obviously men's non-league football is not as good as the Premier League. I watched the EFL or the Football League as it was in, in my younger days. That clearly is not as good as the Premier League. There's no shortage of TV coverage. There's, there's no shortage of newspaper coverage. So the idea that you should only ever promote or show the very best football, well, you'd just be showing the Champions League final every year because nothing else is as good as, as the Champions League. So the quality argument never made sense to me. And the idea that, that you shouldn't have a, a record of, of all the incredible achievements of, of players just because they're female, well, that was crazy. So... Even on Wikipedia, there was no list of um, every scorer. Uh, and myself and Patricia, with the help of a lot of other people, were able to assemble that for the very first time. For the first time, we were able to bring a list, and that is now on Wikipedia because they understandably have used our book as a resource, of every single goal scorer in a Women's FA Cup final. And myself and Patricia would have to thank the so many people that we've spoken to because it has been like piecing together a puzzle you'll find someone who just knows a little bit or, or might have kept something or can put you in touch with someone else. And that's been part of the fascination um, to bring it all together uh, and hearing the individual stories. But it's, it's overarching all of it for me as well is uh, you've got the sporting story here. Now the sporting story is incredible. Winning the, the, the biggest competition that there was for women in the country at the time. I know nowadays the Women's Super League has probably started to edge ahead uh, in the fact that people can now watch it every week on Sky and on the BBC. And in the same way with the with the men's FA Cup, it's not quite as big a deal as it was when I was a kid because the Premier League has overtaken that. But it was through the Women's FA Cup that we got to having a Women's National League in 1991, so 20 years after that uh, first FA Cup final. And it's through the Women's National League that we now have this Women's Super League. So there is a huge amount to say thank you to the the Women's FA Cup for, that we have got to this situation where at the end of this week, December the 5th, two full-time teams, fully professional players, are going to play at Wembley, as should have happened years and years ago. It didn't happen until 2015 that the Women's FA Cup final was moved to Wembley. It's going to be at Wembley, of course. They have already issued 40,000 tickets 
for that game. So it's going to be a great crowd there. It might even by the end of this week top the record, which is 45,000 set back in 2018. It'll be watched probably by around 2 million people live on the BBC. And to look back at where it came from, um, to see players who had basically had to fight prejudice and discrimination to take to that pitch, that a very bumpy pitch. We'll see a bit of it in a news report we're going to play in a minute. Inside a stadium that had pretty much been created for athletics, really, the Crystal Palace National Sports Centre. Not many fans there, not much media coverage. But if it hadn't been for the efforts of all of those players, the officials like Patricia as well, who'd, who'd fought for the right to for that game to take place. And then for the subsequent generations, we'll get to Laurie a few years later in the 1980s. And every generation has just taken it on a little step further to take it to where we are now. This incredible showpiece event that we are going to get at the end of this week and which many of us can't wait um, to watch. Well, Fran, if I could get you to, to now play a news report that I put together at BBC London and it went out in other regions as well, BBC South, and on the BBC News Channel earlier this year, which was um, ahead of the 9th of May, which was 50 years to the very day of that first Women's FA Cup final at Crystal Palace in 1971. And this is a report we put together at the BBC earlier this year. Leslie Lloyd, the captain of Southampton Women, who won it that day, is in the yellow on the left of the screen, and her granddaughter is accompanying her. We took her back to Crystal Palace. So, Fran, if you could play this news report for us now, thank you. I think it was just a wooden stand over there. But um... Back where it all began, Leslie Lloyd. Short of... Granddaughter we, we Lucy. Really... This was Southampton's Wembley at the time. Family it was at Crystal Palace, Palace Athletic Bridge. Stadium on the 9th of May 1971 that Southampton beat Stuart and Thistle in the first Women's FA Cup final. Yeah, yeah that's me, yeah. And Captain Leslie lifted the cup. Yeah. It's overwhelming, really, because I, I honestly didn't think 50 years ago that football would be, you know, in another 50 years as far, ladies' football, as far as it's gone. Nanny's left a legacy, like, great history, in a sense. And, like, women's football's evolved so much nowadays, it's, like, just cool to see where it all started, really. Leslie's generation forced the FA to overturn a 50-year yeah, ban on women playing. But even then, we they the weren't back, welcome. Yes. We had... People saying, oh, ladies shouldn't be playing football. They thought we, we were silly. In fighting to overturn the ban and winning the right to step out here onto a bumpy pitch at an athletic stadium, Leslie and her generation paved the way for what we have now, a fully professional women's Super League and FA Cup finals played in front of huge crowds at Wembley Stadium. Mary Phillip embodies that progress. Six times an FA Cup winner and now manager of non-league Peckham Town, where she last year became the first woman in the country to lead a men's team to silverware. I know what it's like to be on that side of the field and the pressure that it can take. And obviously learn, as a manager, learning to take the stir, pressure off the players and actually getting them to understand what is required of them in a the movement. All the people telling me that little girls shouldn't be doing this and little girls shouldn't be that and you shouldn't be playing football and you should be doing something else. You know, that was wrong. Wow, that's so to saying. celebrate this 50th anniversary, we brought the first Women's FA Cup winning captain and the most recent together. Hi, Leslie. Nice oh. to meet you. Hi, it's nice to meet you. What do you make, Steph, of what, um, what Leslie's kind of generation went through? We have to be so thankful for the likes of Leslie and her peers that have paved the way for us to be in this position now. And yeah, women's football has gone from strength to strength, but only because people like Leslie have allowed us to go and play football. The ultimate prize is equality on the pitch. We're not there yet, but there's been much to celebrate in 50 years of the Women's <laughs> FA Cup final. Chris Legg, BBC London. So, I mean, it, it was absolutely... Chris, can I just interject? Yes, please, can I just interject there? Because yeah. it was the power of that piece, which I which I saw <laughs> live on, on, on BBC um, South today at, at um, 
you know, on that May evening um, that both reconnected us. But I thought the power of what you put together there, both in terms of you know the big picture and the big questions, but also what that meant in terms of the you know the personal backstories, was 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 hugely powerful. Um, and I think whatever it was, that three minute clip did so much. And we come to this from the point of view of sporting heritage and you know what that means. I think you know that resonated so strongly. I just wanted to say that at this particular point. And so thank you for sharing it again here. Yeah, no, well, thank you. And yeah, it was an absolute privilege to meet Leslie Lloyd that day and to hear her memories and also to meet her granddaughter. And I, and the reason, I mean, it was actually Leslie, I think, suggested bringing her granddaughter along and it just made it an even more powerful piece because obviously um, women, young women are still fighting for equality, um, certainly in a sporting context and in, in, in wider context too. And the inspiration for this current generation from what their, you know, their elders faced, which was uh, even more ingrained in society than it, than it is now, um, that is serving to help, you know, empower younger women today. And I know that uh, Lucy there, the granddaughter, has taken so much inspiration from what from what her grandma went through and her, her teammates went through. And um, that, again, is why I think the history of, of, of women's football and this competition in particular is so important. I mean, I have to admit, I remained largely ignorant of it as a man until very, very recently, until I started to really take a proper interest in women's football back in 2017, when it just kind of struck me that, to my shame, really, I've been a journalist my entire career, a sports journalist, and I still didn't really know anything about women's football other than the very biggest teams in London, Arsenal and Chelsea, who we would from time to time cover at BBC London when they were playing in the Champions League. And that's when I just started to think, well, you know, there's a, there's a whole history out there, a whole history that that I want to learn more about all these all these great teams, all these great players. And as I said earlier, just because of the gender of those players, the idea that we're not going to be inspired by their stories is ridiculous. And actually, I'm now more inspired by it because it's not just, you know, anyone winning the FA Cup, that's an inspiring story. Anyone winning the World Cup, that's an inspiring story. But what you've got when it comes to women's sport, women's football is above that sporting story, the human story of the, of the, the barriers and the prejudice and the discrimination that has had to be fought just to even cross that white line. And, and once you start to invest yourself in that story, uh, just anything that a woman has achieved in a sporting context over, this, over the last 50, 100 years is far more inspiring because mm. there's been a whole extra battle um, to face to get there. Um, and I come from it as well from a perspective where I was always, I loved football. I've loved it all my life, but I've always been a hopeless player. Um, and that never stopped me as a kid from being allowed to play it. So there was always the opportunity there. It didn't matter how hopeless I was. Yes, if you were bad at football, other boys would tell you you were bad at football, but you'd still be able to play it. You'd still find a team of your standard to play it. Whereas if you're a girl and you love football as much as I did, tough luck. Even mm. if you're very, very, very good at it, tough luck. And for most of my life, I remain ignorant of the fact of how difficult that must be to cope with, um, to, to be someone who loves football and then to be someone who loves football and is very, very good at it, but is told by society and even by your school that, well, there's no place for you, uh, must be unbearable. And I know that, you know, in, in when you look at the bigger scale of things, even that's not the biggest hurdle that may, many, many women have had to face, but it is, it is the thing that struck a chord with me and has made me think more and more um, about equality in general and anyway it's probably a good time i think is it not to um maybe introduce laurie because she will have far more experience of that um than myself of what it was like to be someone who loves football is very very good at football but um was told there wasn't a place for them so i may have got things a little bit out of order but shall we hear from laurie and then we'll we'll play the highlights a little bit later of um the FA Cup final she was involved in. Um, but but Laurie, yeah, tell us about, um, you know, kind of your your first forays into football um, when you were a, a talented young player, but um, it wasn't easy for you to find those opportunities. Yeah, well, thanks for that, Chris. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for attending. And it's all been said before, but hey, I'll, I'll, I'll go on on how I kind of got into football. Yeah, it, it, it started off, in actual fact, I had a little plastic ball and I was outside a cage 
where all the boys were playing. Well, no, all the boys were, but not playing. And they came over to me and they said, do, do you want to join in and play play with us? But by the way, can we have your football? And for some reason, that's how it all started for me. And I kind of grew up playing with boys in the park, thinking nothing unusual. I could have been another lad with a football, didn't think anything of it, joined in with them. They all took me as like, it was just normal. And then when I was at school, in my primary school, there was, we had an hour for break time and there were three teachers that came on. The middle teacher specifically banned me from playing because it was unladylike. And so I kind of, I had to live with the fact, I, I'm, and I'm a bit of a goody-goody, so I didn't like playing either side of her duty, but I did. Um, but so, yeah, my first bit was, yeah, you get banned. And then while the boy, while this woman was on, I was happy to play some stupid game called Fairies and Witches with the other girls. And then when she went off, then I was back on playing football, which is what I wanted. Secondary school, not a lot different. Um, I was up, wasn't actually banned. It just wasn't offered. So there's not a lot of difference technically. The other one, I was actually banned. This, they, they just wasn't offered. We just did netball and tennis. Um, so I still played with the boys down the park up to about 13 or 14. And it was, it was one of the lads there who said, oh, my football team that I play with in the evening class where I go just next door, Chelsea ladies train. I went, what girls play, even me, girls play football. I said, oh, anyway, I went along and then that was it. Then I was in the team playing, playing regularly, 11 aside, although, we you had to do everything yourself I can get onto that later but um so that's how it started I then went on to college and we had there was a group of girls here in my first year who were kind of already organized and we played football there that was good but could never really get in a league because every year different students came in different students went out but like this WFA Cup, really, really important. You could always join in the Cup. So that was fabulous. Love, love the Cup. So that was at Dartford. And then while I was still at Dartford, the, we didn't seem to have enough players towards the end of my time there. So I started, I wanted to go back to Chelsea, but Chelsea now train at the, like, North London. And that gave me trouble because I was just starting my teaching career um, really, 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 really tiring. Lots to do. I couldn't afford time to travel to North London across to, uh, across the country, uh, across um, town because I'm a South London person. So I thought oh, I'm going to give up on Chelsea. But Ch and Chelsea were a good team. I, I remember we, you know, the, at the time, like we were um, five aside, all England five aside runners up. They were a good team. So I really didn't want to give up, but I had to. So I thought, oh well, that's the end of my football career. I'll just find a team that plays locally. And so I went up, I'd, I'd been up the top of my road on Clapham Common and some girls were kicking about. Sure enough, not at the Chelsea quality, but it was a game of football. So I thought, oh, I'll, I'll join in with them. And 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 we weren't that good, but it was fun. I enjoyed it. So then then it then it developed into, I don't know if you've heard of the Met Police Five Asides. Have you heard of the Metropolitan Police Five Asides? Yeah, I have. huge yep. competition. Anyone, if you've got five players and an adult, I think, who was 17 years above or to be your manager, you could put a team in. <laughs> and our team of Fulham, our manager at the time, picked up two players. Um, one, well, I'm, I'm thinking this. I mean, Marianne, might, Marianne Spacey might tell me differently, but I think we picked up Marianne Spacey from the Met Police Five Asides. And the other player we picked up who didn't even know football existed was Brenda Sampiri, who is my absolute idol, absolute brilliant player. So, so from this team that weren't brilliant, that I just joined just because I wanted to play, we started to get a good team and we went from being really quite poor. And this is the journey where the FA Cup kind of had an impact on us. We, we, we got better in our league and we could win our league. But when it came to the Cup, when you played the best teams, we couldn't quite beat them. So if we came up against Southampton, if we came up against Doncaster, St. Helens, but we could maybe hold them off and maybe get the, like that team, was it, was it Clapton yesterday? Got yep, a, in the seventh got, tier. We could, we could do that sometimes against these good teams. We could hold them off and we had talent. You know, you Brenda, Brenda and Max went on to get tons of caps between them, but we just couldn't quite get, to that next level up. So we decided to change leagues. 
and we went into the same league as Southampton and that was a steep learning curve and we learned a lot from that. And by the time it got to 1985, um, yeah. you managed to crack it. You managed to do it. You managed to yeah, win. Yeah, we did. The yeah. WFA Cup. You were playing Doncaster Bells. So I'm sure most people on this call will, will know went on to become one of the very best team, well, the very best team in the throughout the 80s and the early 90s. And Laurie's team, friends of Fulham, as they were called, because they were set up by female supporters of Fulham Football Club. They didn't have a formal affiliation with, with Fulham FC. But the, the final itself took place at Craven Cottage, just so it happens, the home of Fulham, which would have meant so much more even to these these many South London players in, in the team. But Laurie, tell us, how did it feel to to that day to, to finally do it, to get the better of Doncaster Bells and to, to win the, the FA Cup? Uh, it was, yeah, it was really good. It kind of went back to the quarterfinals. We were going on to the quarterfinals match, playing a team in our league that we knew if we played well, we were going to win. So you kind of you kind of thought, oh, this year's going to be special. And then all of a sudden it's announced it's at Craven Cottage and it kind of feels fate, doesn't it? Your team's name's Friends of Fulham. You're playing at Craven Cottage and it's, yeah, so it was all excited and it, and it was all exciting. And yeah, there we were. We were playing Doncaster again. I don't know if we'd ever beaten them in a proper match. We'd managed to get a nil-nil draw, but then lost the replay 6-1. But I think because we did this switch over to a, the, the harder league and we were playing Southampton regularly who were tough we toughened up and then yeah the, the game went our way and then we won it and it's this kind of dream that you've had as a well I think I had a dream early on I, like you say I used to watch the FA the men's FA comes on all day and you kind of followed it but yeah there you were going out on the pitch you're playing this game, the score's going your way, and then it gets near the end and, and you're kind of thinking, oh, it could go wrong, it could go wrong, anyway, we win. And it's that, that moment final whistle went was a real mixture of emotions. It was it was relief, you've done it. Didn't I don't think you understand at the time how good it is or how important it is and um, just ecstatic... Uh, well, just an ecstatic feeling. You've won this the top place that we can all really achieve really and it was just oh it was unbelievable I mean people use these words like all the words are magical but it was fabulous it was just yeah and and you've done it with all these friends who were your all these players who are actually your mates we weren't paid to play there you weren't and you know you'd had the bad days you'd had the good days but it was your mates and it was yeah it was quite a social thing for us way back then so it was just Oh, great. Well, we're going to play now because uh, it's great that Laurie has kept so much of the memorabilia from, from her career and uh, has kept so much of the video, the, the rare amount that was actually shown on TV at the time. And um, TVAM, the ITV breakfast programme, uh, Breakfast TV, I think only started in this country in 1984 or maybe 1983, so only a couple of years before. Uh, and TVAM, uh, the ITV cameras, had been there to to capture highlights and they played out um, a news report the following morning. So if, if Fran, if you're able to play those highlights, the, the sound on this clip isn't great, understandably, because this is a very old VHS that it's come from. Um, but this is uh, what TVAM showed the following day. Well, back to football now, and we're just five days away from the FA and Scottish Cup finals. But let me tell you, the ladies have already held theirs. Jeremy Thomas reports. Craven Cottage, the home of Fulham Football Club, nestling by the side of the Thames in southwest London. An appropriately pretty setting for this year's Women's Football Association Cup final. The two teams fighting for the biggest prize in women's football were Friends of Fulham Ladies FC versus Doncaster Bells Ladies FC. Both skippers were keyed up for the big one. I think it might be quite a lot of goals scored, actually. Uh, we both play attractive football. We like to knock the ball about. We've both got equal skillful players, strong defence, so I think there could be some goals scored today. It's a climax and a very big season for us and it's very, very important to a lot of players. We've got a lot of players that have been around for quite a number of years and a few youngsters as well, but it means a lot. It's the, um, the highest place you can get to in women's football apart from international support. Before the kickoff, a minute's silence for the victims of the tragic fire at Bradford City. 
Then the national anthem, followed by the ritual team presentation. Those skeptical few among the crowd were soon won over by the excellent skills and steely contentness of the play. And it was Fulham, the more mobile side, who deservedly took the lead halfway through the first half. A rasping half volley from the number 10, Terrell McAdam, which left the Doncaster keeper with no chance. Five minutes later, further skillful approach play by Fulham saw Cathy Hines let onto a square pass and delightfully chipped the luckless Doncaster keeper who did well to get anywhere near it. The second half rain slowed the pace and prevented further scoring. So, Fulham clinched the FA Cup to go with the league and the League Cup, a treble their male counterparts Everton attempt this week. The celebrating was unrestrained, both on the pitch and in the dressing room. Everything, everything. We, I mean, expect them one, but we're all three amazing. And um, I just don't know. There's no words to express how we feel. Yeah. So we're celebrating tonight. Few absentees from work tomorrow. Uh, no, we've all taken the day off. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not knowing if we were going to take the day off. And that decision looks to be a very necessary one. With aquatic scenes of celebration like these, I think they'll have a pretty watertight excuse. Laurie, what's it like um, seeing that again? Oh, it's, oh, it's cool. It's lovely, and it's lovely seeing the girls. And yeah, oh, yeah, great. But yeah, my 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 first thought was when Jill, our captain, said, "Oh, we will take the day off tomorrow." I was thinking, well, some of us have got to go back to school on Monday, so I've not got the day off. But, no, it was just lovely. It just makes me smile. We we had so much so much fun we had a, a core of girls that were together for years and years and years and years and years it was so i mean social bit was really really important yeah do you, do you want me to go on or yeah no? well no, I, I was going to say um going back to my point earlier about you know the the argument when i was younger oh why are we showing it it's not good enough and and the question to me now when i look at it now it's like how was it even that good you know because People, people looking at it, comparing it to professional men's football, which has been professional by a century for a century by that point. Uh, and you guys were getting no support still. Um, so by the time you've won this final, that's the 14th Women's FA Cup final, but you're still not really getting any help. You know, okay, this one has been shown on, on TV, at least the, the footage of it. You're not getting much media support, you're not getting much support from wider society, and you're juggling all of this with with family life and with careers you, you know yet, yeah. as Jill mentioned you, many of you are having to take time off work or go straight back to work to even get to to any away games is going to be such a hard thing for all of you to have to have dealt with throughout um throughout your careers so you know that argument that oh this isn't as good as men's football how could it ever be as good when it when it's had that so many handicaps to have to to deal with so little support it's amazing that you were able to to play to the level that you were able to play at. And, and that's something that has really struck me um, watching some of the footage I've been able to watch, some of the some of the, the goals that are actually score, scored. They're actually brilliant quality among some of the goals. It's always uh, the highlights, um, the, the mistakes that seem to get flagged up when people are having this debate about quality. But there is so much quality in there, um, but it just hasn't been seen by the wider public. And then the other thing that struck me and I don't want to make it too negative because these are great, great memories for you. Is is I don't know if people heard the the, the sign off there by Richard Keyes, the um, the presenter at the end when the celebration shots in the bath, and he said, "Oh, it's a shame we couldn't have stayed on that a little bit longer." And I think, it, as a man, I think even ten years ago, I'd have just thought that's a bit of a harmless quip. But when you see that, and when I know there was a line earlier on in that report about um, this is an appropriately pretty place for this final to take place by the Thames kind of alluding to the fact that women you know women are pretty and, and just kind of bringing that in there unnecessarily how do you feel when you kind of look back at the way women's football was covered yeah I I, I mean I I hear that like the, the appropriately pretty bit wasn't necessary but yeah annoying I I, I got I got more annoyed when I would read it, which is not good because it means that I've kind of got acclimatized to these poor things going on and, and it's 
kind of even natural to me who should be picking it up you know so and, and it'd be things like um if i'd read in the paper you, you know that um there were you probably got more coverage about women's football in the paper in the letters pages you know like people saying oh i watched the final i was pleasantly surprised i can cope with that um and then they say all positive things and then spoil it and it's really irritating with i don't even have to, i don't even have to tell most people like oh i wish they would they swap shirts at the end and you just see oh this is just yeah that now that irritated me that uh, because it stuck out but i suppose the the thing that you said about the sign off bit where he said oh we i think we pulled out of there a bit too quickly i can't remember what it was and the appropriately pretty setting are probably even more not dangerous but you know in a way because there's kind of more acceptable then that makes it a little bit more worrying uh, like uh, and it tells you where we have got to on being accepted rather than uh, I think most people know I wish they swap shirts at the end they that's just so blatantly obvious you don't even have to argue one way or the other or if you do then it's not worth the argument because they're not then they're, they're not switched on really but yeah yeah I mean and it all says to me that you know the ban or the ban was overturned in late 1969 late 1970 early 1970 which paved the way for the, the first women's FA Cup competition of 1970-71 but even though the ban wasn't there, you know, women still hadn't been welcomed into the game. They still hadn't been accepted yeah. as equals. Yeah. And many would say still haven't been today. But so much of the newspaper coverage that I've found in the 1970s and the TV coverage like there in the 1980s is, is clearly seen through male eyes. You know, it's, it, yeah. they're allowed to play now, but they're playing on our terms. And there was yeah. a newspaper article I found in the Hammersmith and Shepherds Bush Gazettes for the 1978 final when um, Southampton beat QPR 8-2, uh, highest scoring women's FA Cup final has ever been. But within that report, there's some really, really good descriptive stuff about the match itself, which is great. But there's also this extra stuff, which is just completely irrelevant yeah. to a sports report. Yeah. So the, the headline on the article is Foundation Cream and 44 Shin Pads. And it talks about... Um, it talks about that the, the the QPR players wriggling into their white shorts and striped tops. The boots are laced up, the bras are adjusted, and the perfume sprayed behind the ears. Now, I can't believe anyone was spraying perfume, and it, it, it's just it's just it's almost like a male fantasy is trying to be lived out in in what should really be a report about the biggest football match in women's football of that year. And it, it's, it's there is so much of that, so much of that in the newspaper coverage. So much of that in the, in the TV coverage that there was. Um, I was lucky enough last week to speak to many members of, of that QPR team who the year before, in 1977, had become the first London club to win the Women's FA Cup. They beat Southampton in the 1977 final um, by one goal to nil. And uh, Fran, we've got a photo of the, the newspaper coverage from that 1977 final. And it was... Uh, the winning goal was scored by Carrie Staley. And this was, I think this was the mirror. I could be wrong. Um, but the first thing that struck me when I saw that, just the pose that, that she's been asked to assume there, it's just such an unnatural pose. I can't imagine any male player being asked to assume that pose. And um, I asked Carrie about this photo last week when I was lucky enough to talk to her. And she was angry about it at the time. She was asked by the photographer to put on some lipstick and kiss the cup. Now, I know a lot of men have been asked to kiss the cup because that is a, that's a photo moment. We've seen men do that over the years, but I can't think any man has ever been asked to, to put on lipstick. And she said at the time she was, she, well, she said he was lucky that he didn't get a, a smack because she was so angry. She refused to do it, but she did do this as a, as a kind of compromise. Um, assume that, that kind of, that strange position there. Um, and hold up the cup and it you know it, she still remembers it she still remembers that really bizarre request she remembers it feeling just so out of place that she should be asked to do that after the biggest moment of her football playing days winning winning the fa cup and instead of just being able to kind of revel in in the glory of that and 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 share the sporting side of that success she was being asked to do something really quite bizarre and and inappropriate so that pervades all of the coverage and I, I know it's not just something in the dim and distant past I know that it still happens now I don't think as blatantly when it comes 
to the mainstream media, but there are still examples of it. I certainly know that throughout the first 10 years of my career, I think, you know, from 2000s in the last decade, there was a, a saying that it was often came up, oh, sex sells in, in women's sport. And if we, if we want to get coverage, maybe we just have to do some of these things. And there was obviously that famous example of Seth Blatter, president of FIFA at the time, saying in all earnestness that he thought that female players should wear tight, tighter shorts if they wanted to get more coverage. So that, it's not just a distant thing, actually. That, you know, that, that's within recent history that that undertone, if you can call it an undertone, is probably more blatant than that. Um, has been there kind of holding back what should be seen as just a sporting conquest and a sporting glory um but as i said i don't want to dwell on 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 the coverage of that too much but where did that sit with you laurie in in a way obviously you want you're grateful in a way for more exposure you want there to be more exposure visibility is so key You, you want it to be on tv you want there to be coverage but at the same time there's this there's this way of that that men are only going to cover it in the way that they want women to be seen. Yeah, I, I was kind of, I, I was kind of oblivious to that. I've got to be honest because I wasn't one of the main. I wasn't your Brenda, Marianne, or Terry, one of the main ones, and so I I've got to be honest. I didn't quite pick up on that looking back through all my extensive records you're quite right I can see I saw the blatant ones um but the the more subtle ones when I look back now are the ones that worry me more because they're being written as if people think they're enlightened and they are improved they are more enlightened but there's a long way to go but they think they've got there and you still see it hanging around in the background so if you say if I was actually asked to do it, I've never put lipstick on my face in my life. So I would probably, <laughs> I wouldn't be thinking about all the implications. It would be like, same as her, and they'd be lucky. They'd be lucky to be, no, not lucky, but I'm not violent. I'm not violent, but it's kind of, yeah, I don't know what my reaction would be, but I certainly wouldn't pretty up to do it. I was quite happy. Well, you know, we were called tomboys if you played football. I was quite happy with that because, well, I'll say quite happy with that. Um, I could play football. I just wanted to play football and I had to take what went with it and things changed. Like I say, I was a bit no, I was a bit naive to like all the undertones and things. And it's only when you look back you can see what was going on. But in my own little my own little self, I was just as long as I could play football, I was okay. So when I was banned, that that irritated me the most, if you know what I mean. So it's, I haven't really answered your question, but it's... no, you you have, and um, something it brings me on to the next thing that I wanted to show, which is uh, the 1974 final. Some highlights from from the 1974 final. Um, it's the first goal in this clip that that really interests me, and it it comes on really quickly at the beginning of the clip. So, but we'll watch it all because um, it's good to see anything that still survives. But um, it's the first goal in this clip that really hit home with me about why haven't we been showcasing the quality that was there. So uh, if Frank could play this, this clip in now. So that's 1974, the team that won it in those lovely shirts are Foden's, and they were the first team to beat Southampton in the final. They won it 2-1. Southampton had won the first three Women's FA Cups, and then Foden's, who were named after a, a factory up uh, near che- um, up in Chester uh, that made lorries, and it, so it was a works team. They won that final. Two goals from Alison Leverbarrow, Pat Davis getting the one in between for Southampton. But that first goal from Alison Leverbarrow, is absolute quality. There's nothing, uh, no defenders at fault there. The goalkeeper isn't at fault. I know from, again, much of my lifetime, people have said, oh, women goalkeepers, they're no good. There's nothing a goalkeeper could have done about that goal in men's or women's football. There's nothing a defender could have done. Maybe get a little bit closer, but that happens in, in men's football as well. The shot 
was absolutely exquisite. It went right in the top corner. Glorious goal. And if, if that goal had been played throughout the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years as I was growing up, as the great goals in men's cup finals were, Ricky Villa scoring in 1982, um, 1981 actually for, uh, for Tottenham that year, uh, Steven Gerrard for Liverpool in 2006, those, those great goals which are played endlessly. If you were to show people that quality endlessly, they would see the quality that was there, but it was hidden away and it remains hidden away actually, a lot of this footage from the wider public. And also so much of the FA Cup final when I was a kid was the event. It wasn't about the quality on the pitch. There were so many terrible FA Cup finals when I was growing up. They were not great games, but it was a great spectacle. It was a great event. The coverage was on from breakfast. In fact, it was on throughout the week. The build-up went on throughout the week. On the day itself, you'd have BBC and ITV showing it. Noon to, to tea time, morning to tea time. Um, you would just have so much hype. You'd have great studio guests. Obviously, you'd have commentary. Now, imagine if there was commentary on that clip. Imagine if there was a crowd there. Okay, the, the game was barely publicised. Not many people knew about it. The FA weren't really getting behind this, even though women were now allowed to play. Imagine if you had publicised it. Imagine if there had been a crowd there to see it that day. And imagine how much more impressive it would be as a clip, a bit of TV, if there was a full crowd there in the background. It would make people think, oh, that mattered. But there wasn't a crowd there. So again, you're, you look at it and you almost dismiss it. So if you had a crowd there, if you had a commentator there, if you had studio analysis at half time, if you had that clip played every year in the run up to the next Women's FA Cup final as one of those standout moments, just think where we could have lifted the game to as a football organisation, the FA, and as a society. If, if women's football had been embraced in 1921, when it was very popular after the First World War, instead of banned, think where we would have got to by 1971, 50 years on. We might have had a crowd there for that game. We might have had proper live television commentators. So it, it, it just, again, says to me that the quality was there. And it was amazing, actually, to even have, have had that quality just three years after the ban had ended. Think where we could have been if there had been supports over the previous 50 years, rather than just complete neglect and com a complete lack of opportunity. Um, so that's what stood out to me about that clip. I mean, Laurie, did you, again, as, as a young boy, there was no shortage of inspiration and role models and, and games to see and, and to inspire. Was there a time where you did catch a glimpse of any of those um, 1970s finals that, that Kind of inspired you i know they were briefly showing some highlights during the men's fa cup final was there a time where you actually saw something on telly women playing that gave no. you hope no 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 not at all i i, I must have missed it or something because i did but the, the fa cup day was i mean like you say it built up during the week but the fa cup day itself was fun. You you kind of the telly would be on all morning. You go in and out when so called boring discussions were on. You go out and then you come back again. But you kept checking in. It was a big, like you say, it was quite a. It was a big event. Yeah, but no, I missed the. I, 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 I'm not. I'm not surprised you missed sure it because it, it, it was so rare. I mean, it basically, occasionally in the seventies, um, at half time, they would show the goals from the women's uh, FA Cup. I should final. have picked that up, but I don't. I don't actually rem I don't actually remember that. No, but that, well, that's completely understandable Strange, that, you, that you wouldn't see that. Now, I um, I interviewed Jill Coulthard earlier in the year. Obviously, the first mm -hmm. woman to win a hundred caps for England, the only amateur ever to win a hundred caps for England. Doncaster Bell's captain, very much a part of the Doncaster Bell's team that did win those um, six FA Cups they won in the end throughout the eighties and and nineties. She did actually catch a glimpse of. I think it was the QPR. Southampton game of 1976. Southampton won that game 2-1 after extra time. She did see the goals from that game on BBC coverage and it truly inspired her. It made her realise there was an FA Cup for women and it gave her hope that there was, you know, there was a reason to keep playing and she was facing all of those challenges that you did and she's older than you. It, you know, it was even more ingrained in society. She wasn't able to play it school and um a few years later she was obviously playing in cup finals herself 
And uh, Mary Phillip, who we saw in the first clip we played earlier this afternoon, who went on to win the FA Cup herself six times and became England's first black captain. She herself was watching the 1990 final um, in which you played, didn't you? And she, in that Derby was, County. Yeah. yeah, that was shown on Channel 4 as highlights. They yeah. showed yeah. an hour. So by 1990, Channel 4 yeah. had taken the step and they were a very progressive channel. That was part of their remit. They were showing an hour of highlights and Mary Phillips saw that um, in her living room in Peckham. And again, that gave her hope. So it just shows again how important the visibility is. But you were lucky yeah. to catch it because, I mean, obviously you didn't see any. Most young girls wouldn't have seen any. She just stumbled upon coverage that day um, of, of it happening on Channel 4. And it made a world of difference. And if, if the visibility had been there, we'd have an even greater talent pool uh, than we have now. Um, but at least slowly we are beginning to get their regular games now on the BBC uh, with the Women's Super League. But we've only, only just got there. We've only just got within the last two or three years where, where we are televising women's games on a weekly basis, whereas that's been happening in men's football, well, since the 1990s. I know that even league football in the, in the 80s wasn't all that common, but when Sky came about... In 1990s, obviously, there's been no shortage of men's football to in inspire my generation when they were growing up. So that visibility really struck me, that that quality from Alison Lever Barrow's goal. And I, I'm sure you'd have seen plenty of that quality throughout your I, I can remember career. one thing. I can remember one thing that stuck out. When I was playing for England once, we were in, I think it was Finland, and we won the match 2-1. I didn't think anything of it. We were back at the hotel getting ready for probably for dinner or something. And their national news came on and a bit like our national news at the end of the national news, it was our, our match was on the telly, like our international match was on the telly. And it's kind of, I saw myself because I was a defender and I saw myself bringing the ball out of, out of the goal because um, on their, on the one goal they scored, but their country, I know when would that have been late eighties, uh, but their country already had that on the on their national news. So, so a bit like you see the clips of the England games now, the men's games. Back then, it was like such a such a shock for me. I mean, I mean a pleasant shock, but it was like, well, different people uh, seem to be a, a bit ahead of us. But I think if you see football on the telly in your living room, it makes it it makes it more real. People don't have to. We don't have to talk about it. You look at the picture and the girls are playing football and that's normal. It's or seen as normal. And that, that's a real big step forward. And, and just last question for me, Laurie, before I hand back to Derek. How do you yeah. feel about where we are now? Like I say, with, with regular games from the WSL, with the build-up we're going to get this week to Arsenal against Chelsea at Wembley yeah. in the FA Cup final, live on the BBC, really good crowd there, 40,000 tickets issued already. How do you feel? Do you, you should feel pride in, in what your generation am, has done. I, I is think it excitement? It, is there any understandable kind of jealousy? I know I'd feel a bit jealous, but how, how do you feel? Yeah. Um, first off, I didn't think I'd ever see it happen this quick. I thought at some stage it's got to happen and people have got to experiment and try and throw money at it and make it happen. But I didn't actually even think that it would. But I think it's tremendous. I think they're trying to do the right thing. I think the game, I watch the girls' games now and I don't see females, I see a game of football. And that, to me, and I'm quite critical, ex-PE ex teacher, quite into movement. So if the movement doesn't look quite natural, I would be critical. But I watch the girls' game and it just is a good game of football. So I, I'm delighted for everyone who's 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 there now um and if you say am I okay I suppose the word's jealous or something like that I, I don't actually think I am but, but I think I, we've had a little conversation before and I can remember if you'd have asked me way back when I was a youngster I would have loved that but I've had quite a nice life with my teaching and wouldn't want to give that up and so I kind of for me I was in the right place at the right time I I got so much satisfaction from women winning the FA Cup. That was just brilliant. And I've had an enjoyable teaching career. So I'm kind of probably one of the odd ones that you would ask that question to and not give a, uh, a thing. Oh, I wish I could have done that. So 
So yeah, but I think they, I think the girls' games now are really good. I enjoy watching it, and, and I kind of got a, you know, I I I got a, a coat. I like the purity of the game. I like looking. At, I don't support a particular team. I like watching the game of football. I don't care which person's on. I like the game itself. So, and I watch the girls' games. So I think they're brilliant. Great, thank you, Laurie. And uh, yeah, Derek, I'll, I'll hand back to you now. Thank you, Chris. Laurie, Chris, I think I'm sure, like everybody else, I could just listen to you and that conversation really all afternoon. For me, it just epitomizes everything that I'm passionate around sporting heritage um, uh, and why it's so important that we preserve in this way the, the these wonderful memories but also that wider learning that comes out of of that experience and, and the way in which you've captured that and held on to that I think is, is is so powerful and I know we were speaking just um just before we came on live about the significance of May 2022 when um, the, the the Women's Cup final, FA Cup final and the men's final will converge at Wembley, I think, for the for the first time. And I think one of our commitments out of this is to look at what we can do. And obviously, education lead is my background in sporting heritage, but what we can we can do around this and perhaps using our conversations this afternoon to carry on that dialogue, because for me, you know, the, 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 the last, goodness me, it's been nearly an hour and it's just flown by, um, you know, has captured all of those questions um, around the personal story, but also the wider questions, the intrinsic love of the sport itself, but what we can learn from that experience. And also, you know, to promote an increased participation, I guess. Look, I've, I've got a thousand and one questions, but I'm, I'm going to pause there. And Fran, perhaps you might come in. I know we've got one very specific question that, that's come through from Tim, and Tim does the most incredible work um, to, to, to get together um, um, with Liz's wife at, at, at Ipswich around the heritage of the club there. And the question is around um, the, 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 if you like, any record, and you, you may have something on this, Chris, around Ipswich Town women's FA Cup record, um, they've been searching for an archive, um, even of FA Cup semi-finals. Is there anything is it, that that you could shed any light on there for Tim? Well, so a lot of my well, my research was really based around the final. That's where I wanted to get to first. Was just actually getting a firm record of of what happened in women's FA Cup finals. But there is some work, great work being done by a couple of people called Tim and Rob. Um, who actually got in touch with Patricia and Patricia put them in touch with me and they are trying to collate. I'm sure they'll be happy for me to share it. They're trying to collate every result that has ever happened. Now that is a challenge. That is a real challenge, uh, but they're doing very, very well. Um, I know Ipswich have done well in recent years, haven't they? They played Leicester a couple of years back, um, lost to Leicester who were in what was then the championship and Leicester themselves then nearly beat Manchester City, who are one of the very biggest clubs in women's football. So I don't have the answers myself to specific teams records. And that's something I really, I want to myself get across. That was going to be my next challenge when I learned what Tim and Rob were doing. And they're so far into it anyway, uh, that it will be those guys who will have the answer. Um, and I, we might not have to wait too long before we start to work out you know, individual clubs, the achievements that they've got. And again, that's a mystery to me, whereas in my entire career as a journalist, you can find out very easily, this is the best that team have done in the FA Cup since 1918, whatever. You know, you could just find it in books then on the internet. Um, with women's football, it's just, it hasn't been out there. There, has, there wasn't the luxury to record it in, in the WFA era because just getting a game on, just, just getting the kit, just getting the pitch, just getting the referee, just keeping clubs alive, that was a challenge enough. Whereas men's football has always had endless resources, really, you know, going back to the Victorian era to, to record at length because it was, you know, a, a leisure, a hobby pursuit as such to, to record all of that. And then it was um, encapsulated in a, in a professional era anyway. So you had sports people making a living out of um, keeping those records. Whereas women's football has not had, that luxury. I, I'm slightly more mystified how by when the WFA handed over to the FA, a lot of that record keeping doesn't seem to be there or has gone astray. And I'm, I'm, it's harder to fathom 
how that happens. Um, but in answer to that question, I don't have the answer myself, but I'm confident that those kind of answers will be with us before too long. Brilliant. It's fantastic to know that. I think Patricia's trying to come in. I think Patricia, yeah. 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 Sorry, I was just going to suggest that, um, and and I think, Chris, um, I put Joe Annis in touch with you. Joe is from Lowestoft and has got the excellent archive of Lowestofters activities. And I just wonder whether he might be able to help the Ipswich people. Um, Not entirely, but to a degree. Thank you. Very good. I I, I guess if we're able to join that up, Fran, perhaps um, afterwards, it'd be fantastic if if we're able to share those contacts. And thank you, Chris. Thank you, Patricia, for for that insight on on potentially where we are. And I know Tim um, and the team there um, that do that and the the most amazing work around Ipswich Down um, would, would, would value that. So thank you. Fran, have I, have I been missing anything from the chat? I've tried to monitor, but I, I've occasionally challenged on these things. Uh, no, I think we've picked up that everything particular. so far. I had I had a question though, um, <clears throat> coming at it from a from a collections point of view. And sorry, Laurie, this is this is aimed at you. Yeah. Um, okay. Obviously, we're talking about recording, you know, and and just even mapping out the achievements of the, of the women's team, but have you personally kept kit and programs? I come from a, a museum collection background, so I like physical, tangible things. So I didn't know whether you or if you know of any of your peers have kept this sort of information. All right, you're breaking up for me, but I'm guessing you're saying you will. Oh, Laurie, can you just say that again? Yeah, I think we generally froze there. A number of us. I think that was. I think that was a lot of us freezing. So yeah. yes, if, if you did, you collect anything yourself from your career, Laurie? Maybe it's tactical. <laughs> yeah, maybe she doesn't want to <laughs> give that up. I um, yeah. I think Laurie seems to have been very good. Um, at all the people that Patricia has kindly put me in touch with. Laurie, oh Laurie, you're back. You're moving again. Can you hear us? No, she's been really good. I mean, she's kept records, and um, as Patricia was mentioning there, That's Joe and is from oh, Lowestoft yeah. kept a lot of records. Uh, there are players out there, and, and you're just so grateful when you find them. Who have, who have held on to things, information, but also their own keepsakes. Are you back with us, Laurie? Can you hear yeah, us? Yeah, I am back. I've got, I got things like, I used to keep, uh, where is it? Like records of my, of our clubs, games. I've got pretty much from 81, 82 up to 89. The first, second and third team I've got, I've got like all the appearances, not you... absolutely brilliant, but the appearances at that time when we negotiated. Um, oh, frozen again. Ah, never mind. Laurie, did, did you? If did you can you hear us, did you keep medals? Yes, I can. Did you, you keep, did you keep your medals? Did you keep shirts or anything like that? Or... Oh yeah, everything. I, like when we got, when I went away with England, I kept like oh everything we were given. Yeah, I've got a little. We've got a little trophy cabinet of the best ones, but our team was a brilliant five-a-side team, and then then pretty much all in shoe boxes because there were so many. We were we started off as a really good five-a-side team, and and we and you the training at the time was more to do with five-a-side because you played in school pitches at school playgrounds, and the coaching was around that. The difficulty for my generation was to be coached on grass, and unless you played that league representative level or regional level you didn't ever really get what I would call coaching I I got my FA prelim and that level of coaching you didn't get we had a coach who like at our evening class who had that level of coaching but it was we were still not coached in boots nobody was you, you just didn't play in boots right until right near the end so it's a different feel you know like how a control over a plastic ball is not the same as a control in boots with a um, and most players didn't see that I've forgotten where I was going but there you go no no sorry can I it's Patricia just to say if anybody I don't know who is on this um on this zoom but I know Laurie's kept a lot of stuff and gradually 
I've managed to trace 79 of the 91 England players that played during the WFA era. A lot of them amazingly don't keep anything. So Laurie is an exception. But um, I, I had some stuff just last week from Michelle Curley, who's later than you in her England career, Laurie. So yeah. if anybody knows of anybody who's got stuff, then please let us know. Yeah. That's just a, a, an appeal. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of telling that hugely powerful story, how wonderful, I'm sure, Fran, you're positively salivating having heard some. Yeah. <laughs> You're an absolute museum's dream, Laurie, to have all that information, and particularly you know, well, then to then to have all the stories to back it up, and you know all the anecdotal oh, and joy. emotional backup. Because I'm, I'm, um, we we were talking with a Paralympian recently, um, and he was talking about all the kit that they'd been given, and he said all oh, over several house moves, he just got rid of lots of it. And, you know, he said, who wants to wear these, this old kit? Nobody wants to wear it anymore. And I was like, oh, my God, from a museum <laughs> point of view or from a heritage point of view, we within our network, we know people who would have absolutely bitten his hand off to have had his, you know, track kit from five years, 10 years ago. But it's it's all about, you know, whether you perceive there's still a value in it, I, even if it's not value for yourself, whether there's value in it for, for other people. But it obviously it's all still really valuable. I can tell for you and for your story so <clears throat> yeah that's yeah that that, that makes me very pleased <laughs> from yeah we, we were we were remember I said to you about that we were quite a social club like I like a lot of our footballing was to do with social so we trained twice a week and then after training we'd go down the pub not to get drunk but we'd go down the pub um, and down the pub we were really lucky that there was a, a fringe newspaper as such and the sports journalist and the editor and, and and another guy were really great mates with all of us and we got phenomenal coverage of like a couple of years I'm talking color pictures back page you don't see that with I mean this is back in 83 84 and and the, the sports journalist actually followed the home counties league for a whole year like three divisions so i and I kept it and my parents were news agents so like in the early days I've spoken to Chris it's kind of like spot the spot the little bit of where it said about the WFA Cup semi-final but because my parents were news agents I would scour your times and your te your telegraph and all of all of them to get that clip it so I got quite a bit but it's kind of it's Fulham related friends are Fulham related but I have got yeah quite a bit That's just just amazing. I'm just I'm just picking up because I'm con conscious of time. Um, Maggie and I guess you, you, you're very much on, on, you know, still live on the webinar. You're just talking about um, a contrasting experience that you had with with QPR in the 1970s, and uh, the the coaching experience you had there, contrasting to Laurie's. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anything you want to comment on, Maggie, just to am amplify that. Um, well, nothing really. I, I think what we found, um, or if you reflect back, different clubs, it had different experiences based on what was available around them. I mean, we were another London club like Friends of Fulham, who are actually closer to me than QPR, but there you go. <laughs> um, we, we were very fortunate. We had Sav Ramayon, who I've mentioned, and he was a semi-pro player himself. And there was a rumour that whatever training he went through, we went through afterwards. Oh, wow. So <laughs> wow. um, we, he got us pretty fit, but more than that, he got us playing and understanding the game as a team, not mm -hmm. 11 individuals on the pitch. It was team effort. And mm -hmm. that's, that's where I think we had our successes mostly. And, and, and just in case anyone on the, Call doesn't know this is Maggie Flanagan from QPR who also won won the FA Cup in 1977. So we've got another FA Cup winner here with us, Maggie, oh, and it's, yeah. <laughs> it's great to hear your uh, your experiences as well. Thank you. You're well, welcome. thank you. That's again what a, what what a privilege, Fran. I think probably we're approaching the well i'm going to say the final whistle uh, the, 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 <laughs> the, oh, sorry about that <laughs> i've got to get that um, at, at this particular point I'm, I'm just tracking if there's anything anybody else wants to 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 raise 
I think I'm up to speed on the on the chat there. So yes, any any final questions? I'm afraid yes, we are going to finish slightly yeah. earlier than our, our yeah. published time due to some other unforeseen commitments. Patricia, was there something you wanted to say? Sorry. Sorry, no, it's no. Maggie again. Oh, sorry, Maggie, uh, go on. Sorry, Maggie. That's okay, friend. It, it's not a question. I just want to say um, I've enjoyed this. And oh, good. Uh, yeah, Lovely. particularly watching the videos. And yeah, I picked up on the sexist comments. And whilst <laughs> women's football's moved on, I'm not so sure society has moved on quite as yeah. quickly. Mm. Uh, we've yeah. still got a way to go. And I think the young players of today have still got a way to go. So if anybody's around in 50 years time, you know, <laughs> maybe they could like to do the same. Uh, and I think that, uh, well, uh, and that's the, you know, the absolute power and just how wonderful um, opportunities like this are to, you know, to uh, share that thinking and to think about how we can collectively look to further uh, promote and, and move forward. Um, Fran, I'll, I'll, I'll obviously leave it to you, you know, finally, but, just Laurie, Chris, we cannot thank you enough. It it's been such a joy and privilege, and uh, and and Maggie to have your reflections there. Um, you know, in 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 that latter part of the conversation makes that even more special. And I'm I think what I'm hoping um, is that this is now the opportunity, to perhaps, where we can build on on what we've experienced this afternoon. And we mentioned earlier. Um, the, the May 2022 with the um, the two FA Cup finals together, perhaps that might present present an opportunity for us to build forward there. But um, I, you know, can honestly say I don't think um, I've enjoyed a webinar um, as as much as this one. An absolute joy. Thank you both so much for making this afternoon so special. Um, absolute privilege, and thank yeah, you to everyone. Brilliant. Um, you know, for, for, for taking part and engaging. Fran, I'll pass back. Lovely. Thanks, Derek. Yes, I'd like to reiterate what Derek's just said. So thank you very much, Laurie and Chris, for your time and, and, and the generosity of the things that you shared with us this afternoon and for everybody who's been on the call. From a sporting heritage point of view, just picking up on what Derek was saying, we're hoping that, you know, we will continue this thread through through to May next year. And I know outside of the FA Cup final, there will be some um, strands of either webinars or work going on within Sporting Heritage that leads up to the Women's Euros next year as well. Um, so we will let everybody know if you if you don't get it already, please do sign up for our newsletter. There's a link on the homepage of our website. Um, that's the quickest and easiest way to find out about what we've got on. Um, we've always got a pretty packed schedule. Um, but apart from that, I'll bring the session to a close. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon and I hope to see everybody again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh,